Okay, good morning, I think we can start. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm very glad to be introducing today's workshop, Frontiers of Anti-Racism, Struggles of Migrant and Racialized Subjectivities, which has been organized by Chiara Milan, Anna Lavizzari, Lorenzo Zamponi, other than myself. I will just say a few words to introduce a little bit uh, today's work workshop, um, to share with you the initial ideas, doubts, and questions that pushed, up, pushed us to organize this workshop. Um, so, of course, uh, struggles of migrant and racialized subjectivities, which is the subtitle of today's workshop, uh, refer to an extremely broad number and uh, to very different types of struggles some of which overlap, while others remain distinct. Um, and these encompass struggles in the workplace for workers' rights, organized mostly, although not exclusively, around base unions in Italy, um, struggles for housing rights, largely organized at the movement level, struggles for the residence permit and the access to citizenship. We can think about many examples of mutualistic practices, struggles for life and freedom of movement at the borders that are more or less articulated around organizations, more or less visible, and yet so clearly political movements, possibly in the most literal sense. And then struggles against racism to counter racially based violence and to advocate for the access to equal rights and social justice. Struggle of migrant and racialized women who infused other movements with new ideas, new perspectives, new theories, less universalistic and more mindful of differences. And while all these heterogeneous struggles are there, and I would say very poorly acknowledged, the key word for accessing today's reflection is frontiers. And frontiers not so much as a synonym of borders, but as a metaphor to ask what boundaries are set and what ties are built by the people who participate in these struggles. So with this workshop, we wish to explore the different ways in which migrants and racialized subjectivities self-represent themselves in collective struggles, and in turn, how these processes of collective identification are related to, forms, to the forms and the scope of these struggles. Um, so we know that uh, discourses and struggles against racism in Italy have largely focused on the experience of migration. Uh, with well over 20 years of history of struggles. Uh, and these struggles uh, were um, contrasting specific configurations of racism impacting upon the lives of migrants. And of course, this is a type of racism that is deeply intertwined with capitalism and its forms of exploitation and is rooted in the nation state system as the constant exclusionary practices and regulations against migrants demonstrate. In more recent years, we've started to witness some mobilizations, the last would be Black Lives Matter, <clears throat> that visibilized a number of other experiences of racialization, sometimes building a continuity with migrant struggles, and at other time taking a distance from them. Uh, what, we, what these mo recent mobilizations certainly um, have shown is how racism in its different configurations configurations is impacting upon the lives of ever wider social groups whose access to rights, spaces and opportunities might even be um, granted formally at times, but remains de facto largely denied. So uh, while the current um, juncture is characterized by new articulations of racism impacting upon ever wider social groups, as I was saying, we also see a plethora of different constituencies and different people who identify as racialized subjectivities and start engaging in collective action. And we ask how different people, their stories, and the claims of the groups they belong to shape different anti-racist articulations, and whether and on what basis a common ground is sometimes established across uh, various struggles. So today's workshop is going to be divided in two moments. In the morning, we ask some uh, researchers to share their perspectives on the topic, on the questions that we asked. And some of the guiding questions for today's reflections were what theoretical, uh, for this morning reflection, were what, what theoretical tools allow us to understand the current juncture, 
how do we engage with an understanding of racism as a complex and multifaceted social phenomenon, and what implications this complexity entail for social mobilizations countering racism. And then also focus on the genealogies of theories and the translations of these theories across contexts, because as if social formations are the result of particular and historically specific articulations, what theories are able to shed light over phenomena happening across very different contexts? What precautions do we put in place um, to avoid disregarding the genealogy of these theories? And how do we take into account the social context in which we translate them? And finally, also, how can struggles across different contexts can help us understand uh, the Italian context? To start these conversations, we invited uh, scholars, researchers, activists, even though we are very much aware that these categories are not fixed and univocal. And, um, before leaving the floor to Chiara, who will introduce today's guests, I wish to thank all participants who are here today, and uh, in particular all of our guests who so gener generously agreed to come over to Florence or to be here with us online to take some time to discuss these uh, important questions. I also want to, uh, to thank the Ufficio Eventi who assisted us at every step of the organizations and all the people who are assisting today um, on the technical level. Uh, I will now leave the floor to uh, Chiara Milano, who will introduce our morning guests and act uh, as a chair. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, thanks everybody for being here, from our guests to the participants. Uh, we will start, uh, well, the order we will follow is that we will have first Liz Fechette and then Federico Oliveri and finally Angelica. Uh, just to introduce you, uh, Liz, she's director of the Institute of Race Relations, where she has worked for over 30 years. She's also had, uh, she heads the European Research Program and is advi advisory editor to its journal Race and Class. She's also the author of A Suitable Enemy, Racist Migration in Islam Islamophobia in Europe, and her research focuses on contemporary racism, refugee rights, far rights extremism, and Islamophobia across Europe. She has written and lectured on issues of migration, race, and security in Europe. She's also a consultant on refugee and immigration issues to a number of organizations, including the Refugee Council. She has also been part of the Campaign Against Racism and Fascism Collective, and an expert witness at the Basso Permanent People Tribunal on Asylum and the World Tribunal of Iraq. So Liz, the floor is yours. put to us. Uh, they were so complex and so detailed and in fact it was the sincerity of the organisers and I felt their real desire to link the academy up with the struggle. That was the motivation for me to come today and speak to you and I'm um, coming from a country which is bonkers because we have no restrictions now with COVID. Um, so it was a bit of a, a nightmare getting here, I must admit, but I'm very pleased to be here. Um, so I want to explain, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about my organisation later, but I'm not within the academy. Uh, my organisation is an anti-racist educational charity. And she actually said that I've been working there 30 years. Actually, it's more like 40 now. I'm getting up to retirement age, so it's been a long haul. Um, I'm going to tell you a bit more about that later, but I wanted to tell you a little bit about some of the conversations that Angela and myself had before I arrived here. As I said, I felt she was very sincere. Everyone was very sincere about wanting to link up struggle um, with uh, research and with theory. And that's very much a preoccupation of people in the United Kingdom at the moment, in the university. Because the central role of scholars has got to be what Julius Nyerere 
the anti-colonial independence fighter, that he said that the business of the educated is not to fly away from the rest of society on the wings of their skills, but to turn those skills to the service of the people. And this is something that we've been very preoccupied with in the UK. And now let me see if I can get to the next one. <laughs> So the organisation that I work for was founded by someone called A. Simnandon, who was one of the... Uh, it always does this. Uh, stay. He was the founder of our institute. He, he died a few years ago. Um, and he said the function of knowledge is to liberate, to apprehend reality in order to change it. So that's very much where I'm coming from, and I think it's very much where where scholar activists are coming from today. And when I was preparing this slideshow, I suddenly realised that I was just coming here to tell you about all the good books that I've read recently. And, um, so excuse me if uh, this um, is, a, is, is a bit of a tour through my li library. But this book came out recently in the UK, and I think people here in Italy might be very interested in it. Um, as a couple of scholar activists... Uh, based the book on a number of interviews, uh, well, about 20 interviews with people working in the university. And I don't know how things are here for you in, in Italy and whether your university has um, been saved from some of the marketisation. Feel the pressure of the market here in delivering research? because that's very much what's happened in the, in the UK, that neoliberalism, which is the privatisation of state assets, means that the academy has very much been privatised and everything is subject to market forces, which is, which is basically anathema, really, to, I think, intellectual, intellectual engagement. So I think this is a book that you might be very interested in. It raises urgent questions about the role of a contemporary university and academics within them. So myself, having worked both as a researcher and I've been an activist as well, and I've worked with different groups facing oppression, over the last 20 years I've been working around anti-Muslim racism and Islamophobia that ar arose out of the uh, war on terror. But I've also been looking at uh, nativism and xenoracism. I'll, explain that a bit more later. And obviously, I work also around issues of policing and anti-black racism across Europe. Um, and because you're working you know, on the, all these different issues, which Angela said, the migrant experience, the refugee experience, the experience of, of black people, the experience of Muslim people with anti-Muslim racism, there's something that has come to preoccupy and anti-Roma racism as well. There's something that has come to preoccupy me over the last two or three years in particular, and that is, how can you fight one form of racism without disappearing another? And for me, coming from a small anti-racist organisation that is constantly looking for money to keep going, to pay our wages, this is a real problem because the people who fund you will go for the latest fashion. You know, it might be 10 years ago, they might be pouring money into anti-Roma issues, then it would be this issue, this issue, um, which is fine at the time, but there's no, no common thread. So that's why I'm here today, to talk with you and hopefully learn from you about the common threads between all oppressions. We don't want theory that segregates people into silos, but we want theory that helps people find the unity. All racisms are different, and all racisms are the same. We have to find the common thread. So when we are working around Islamophobia, which I would design, de define as a hostile mindset towards the Muslim world, that's a, a narrative, an attitude. It's a hostile mindset. But when it comes structured into the laws, and particularly in the criminal justice system, which it has been around Europe, where you have a separate and more harsher criminal justice system for Muslim communities, then we can talk about institutional structured racism. And I think the same is also true of... Um, uh, 
Okay, I've just realised I've missed out a page. <laughs> Gone on to the second page. The same is also true of, um, of racism towards migrants, and I'll talk about that a bit, a bit later. So because I've managed to skip a whole page, I'm going back to say that when I was preparing to come here, um, this is what happens when you put things on double sides of paper. Um, but when I was coming here, I suddenly realised that the war in Ukraine has changed everything. It's changed everything that I wanted to say. So, of course, after I accepted the invasion, Russia invaded the Ukraine, displacing, I think it's six, it's six million people, is it, now displaced, many more internally displaced. And why this hasn't changed the brief for me, it sharpened it. And I think, for me, it's quite clear that the world we're living in today is very, very much, in a sense, like what happened before the First World War. Competing blocks, imperialism, arms race, etc. So I think what we see is a clear civilizational racism. So when talking about opportunities as obstacles, I'm going to foreground civilizational racism as the source of both and as a generic form of racism. Everything is changing so fast, and if we are serious about fighting racism, we need to be flexible, as racism never stands still. It manifests itself in different ways at different points in time, in terms of changes to the economy, the social structure, the system, and above all, the challenges and the resistance to the system. And that last point about resistance is so clear after the explosion of Black Lives Matter in summer 2020, as well as the decolonizing movements around the world. And it's not just Confederate statues in the US that have been taken down. It's not just slave statues in the UK that have been dumped in the river, but all around um, the world, South Africa, US, North America, Europe, we are seeing the decolonizing movement. So it is clear that our anti-racist consciousness can't just be Italian, it can't even be European, it has to be global. And that's why we have to be attuned to the geopolitics and the big power games that are going on all around us. I said I'd just say something about the Institute, uh, where I work. Um, we produce a bi-weekly news service that I would urge you all to sign up to. It's all free, and we, we have a massive database on racism around Europe that you can access for free. Um, we also have a journal called Race and Class. I brought a couple with me. Oh, I thought I had one. Oh, yes, one's here. Um, and this is the more uh, theoretical, uh, scholarly aspect of our work. And um, for, for the last 30 years, I've been... Um, um, I've been uh, working, as uh, explained, on the, uh, the books that I've written. This was the latest one. To be quite frank, I didn't sit down to write books. They were small articles that appeared over the course of 20 years and then got collected into a book. Um, <clears throat> so, so there you go. That's the Institute. Um, there's the books. Um, so I've talked about anti-Muslim racism. There's also um, xenoracism, um, which I thought I had a slide on. Let's see if I can find a slide. Here we go. Um, this was a xenoracism, something that I worked with with Asa Vinand and our director. And this happened uh, actually very soon after the war in the Balkans. Um, when you had a lot of people in the right-wing newspapers talking about refugees from the former Yugoslavia and just saying, well, what's happening to them can't be racist because they're white. And this is where we decided to work around this idea of xenoracism because it was quite clear that there was a racism towards Eastern Europeans, towards people from the Balkans, but it wasn't a colour-coded racism. It was racism against foreigners, but it wasn't xenophobia. It wasn't an attitude. It was structured into the welfare state into the things denying people services. And that's why we, we began to talk about xenoracism, which is 
as institutional racism, a structured racism against foreigners. And if you want to dig deeper into this, to look at the theory and the history of it, I would say go to the work of Cedric Robinson, who was, uh, he also died quite recently. Unfortunately, we're losing all the giants. Cedric was on, our, our, on race and class. And Cedric came, uh, wrote a book called Black Marxism, where he wrote about racial capitalism. And what Cedric did was give us the long jure on racial capitalism. And he argued that European civilization from its formative period rested on a division between barbarians and civilized, and that European culture imbibed racialism through its ruler's views of the distinct racial origins of those it ruled. There was an intra-European racism. That is to say there was a pre-capitalist racial ordering of European society. All this coheres in civilizational racism, which mirrors our colonial history. But the problem for us is that racism doesn't necessarily create unity between people who are oppressed by racism. And that's because if we look at racism historically, scientific racism was always built on a hierarchy in terms of skin colour, whereas civilizational racism today might, because of the Holocaust, avoid some of that scientific genetic argument, but it creates a civilizational hierarchy. Um, it, divides, it divides us all from each other in this hierarchy. And in, this, in the UK, we saw this with a government inquiry onto the Commission on Race and Ethnic Disparities, which was a terrible report that came out from the government, but basically created a hierarchy and tried to set one group against each other. And at the bottom of this hierarchy was the black Caribbean community, who was said to have been holding on to grievances and have a victim mentality. And in a very cynical way, they were um, compared to the black African community, who was seen as doing well in the education system and therefore um, a model for other communities. So, <clears throat> moving on, I said that this is what we're facing, a sort of civilizational racism based on hierarchies. And we can see this so much embedded in our immigration laws, in our asylum policy, and in government approaches to integration. It creates a world of hierarchies, but within one coherent system. And I call this, I want to talk about this as a, an example of multi-status Europe. Let me give you a few points about this before moving on to talk about how this civilizational racism is reflected in the treatment of Ukrainian war refugees today. We are taught to look at migration in national contexts, but migration is central to the world economically. It is explicit in how capitalism functions on a global scale. What we have here is a tri transnational migrant class that exists as a mobile army of international labour. Today, the way this transnational migrant class emerges is historically specific to globalisation and the displacement caused by the uneven nature of capitalism, neoliberal structural adjustment programmes that disfigured Africa and also Eastern Europe. Um, this is a book that came out last year in the UK. I don't know whether you have it here in Italy, but I was very um, lucky that Kusai Hong Pai is a, 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 a sister in the struggle. She's a pioneering journalist who goes undercover she first worked um, undercover in the Chinese community in the UK, working, uh, doing the jobs that migrant workers do. And then she came here to Italy and spent time with uh, African migrant workers and wrote this wonderful book, which I was privileged to be asked to write a forward for. So Italy provides a case study of civilizational racism towards the African continent. Angelus asked me to talk about what people in Italy can learn from the European context, but I would turn that around and say people in Europe need to learn from the Italian context. 
And for me, the treatment of African migrant workers is synonymous almost with the Nazi doctrine of life unworthy of life, which is you just leave people to die in the Mediterranean Sea. You super exploit them as uh, uh, undocumented work workers. And I particularly like that quote for, from Hussein Pai. We must confront the nature of a European civilization which finds Africans displaced by neoliberal globalization to subordinate spaces and leaves them vulnerable to the early death. However, we've also got to understand that illegality and legality, free and captive labor, are part of a continuum that the architecture of controls mirror the hierarchies of civilizational racism. Legal measures, asylum, resident, work permit systems, the artificial creation of illegality are designed to enforce economic exploitation and racial exclusion. Legality and illegality are part of a continuum and immigration policy is designed to create sites which, without rights, which allow for super exploitation. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, migrant organizations and supporters got together to organize a, a tribunal. And it was actually across Europe. I don't know if you had a tribunal here in Italy, but I know there was uh, one in Spain. <laughs> And in the UK, we put the hostile environment on trial at this People's Tribunal. And in the UK, we actually, the government said quite explicitly that the purpose of immigration policy is to create a hostile environment to drive those without papers out. So they created a regime to limit migrant access to public services and adopted nativist principles, by which I mean our own people first in immigration law. So I talked about the continuation of legality and illegality. And here's another book from my library shelf that I've read recently that I think could be really interesting to you in Italy. Um, because uh, Luc de Naronha uh, is a sociologist and he went to Jamaica and actually almost had a, worked with black British young people who had spent their formative lives in the... UK, but because of the nature of our immigration laws, were deported to Jamaica once they, uh, uh, if they were convicted of a, of, of a crime. And I think this is an important book, and it's a, it's a lovely book in that it's very easy to read because it's anthropological, but he also makes important points about the higher non-citizenship in multi-status Britain. Now, this statement of multi-status neatly encapsulates the tensions between legal and lived forms of belonging. And he explores the relationship between punitive immigration laws and a punitive criminal justice system. So I'm running out of time, so I'm going to have to whiz through the next. What we've been doing in the, in, in the Institute is looking now at policing. We're looking at what we call territorial policing, a more intensive form of border policing. I haven't got time to talk about that now, but we can go back on it if needs be. Um, and basically, the ter territorial policing that we're seeing in Europe, I'm doing a big study of this at the moment, is you have a different form of policing in multicultural working class areas, in black areas. And I think it's a bit, almost like a continuation of colonial policing. But the flip side of colonial policing, where you have a harsher policing towards black communities, is the under-policing of crimes against them. And I think this was very much, the, uh, I, before I came, I looked at um, some of the activism around Mamadou Liam Tiam's case and compared that to a young black man who was killed in the UK, Stephen Lawrence, a number of years ago, in which after decades of the police not doing anything, the family standing up for rights, there was an official inquiry. So because I'm, and this official inquiry came up with this term institutional racism, and that's very important because the UK was the only country in Europe 
goodness knows we've gone like 100 years back since then, where a government formally recognised that there was a structured racism in, in the system that ne meant to be dealt with. And all sorts of reforms were brought in after that. But unfortunately, we're now in a world where they say we don't need it anymore because we're a post-racial society, which is a load of rubbish, as you know. So very, very quickly, I wanted to talk about how this civilizational racism plays out uh, with the Ukrainian refugees. But I don't think I've got time, but if people want to ask questions, they can afterwards. So it, all I have to say is it's quite obvious. Officially, it's very, very, it must be terrible for asylum seekers and refugees who for years have been uh, denied work permits, denied residence permits, treated as though they were economic migrants, not genuine refugees, to see what's happened in terms of the, the welcome for refugees from Ukraine. Clearly, none of this is the Ukrainian refugees' fault. It's the system. It's the hierarchical system. So you see statements like this from the Bulgarian Prime Minister. And here's a statement from Polish activists working at the border with Belarus. Um, and also with the border with Ukraine. And that's clearly what they're saying. There's a hierarchy at the border. However, what we have to realise when that actually in the uh, countries like Poland and Slovakia, which are taking the majority of Ukrainian refugees, it's not the state who is providing the welcome. The state has no in structure to support refugees. It's actually charities, ordinary people who are doing this. And that's very much in tune with neoliberalism, where you leave everything to the market, the state absence itself. So this is another aspect that we've got to realise. So welcome can quickly turn to hostility. And because it's, the state has abandoned, it opens up the, the way to all sorts of abuses. And as most of the refugees are women and children, we've already seen how they're vulnerable to sex traffickers and exploiters who have already made the way to the borders to pick upon them and prey upon them. As the UN Secretary General said, for predators and human traffickers, the war in Ukraine is not a tragedy, it's an, a woman, it's an opportunity, and women and children are the targets. We see how the good refugee, uh, uh, bad migrant scenario has been instrumentalised. But of course, this is all something that can change very, very quickly. Um, and what we've seen is, in a way, what we see with the Ukrainian refugees is that refugee policy is being turned into an instrument of managed migration, and Ukrainians are just going to be uh, integrated within the uh, exploitative migration system. Uh, I think I've run out of time, so I just want to conclude with this point. I think as scholars and researchers, how can I put this? It's obviously, it relates to being on the journal, working on the journal, where we get a lot of submissions uh, to the journal, both from scholar activists and the more heavily academic pieces. And sometimes in the ha more heavily academic pieces, you feel that the experience of migrants and refugees, of the victims of racism, it's being plundered in almost a, in a way. It's almost like they are used as examples to advance a theory which is only of use in an academy, to be blunt. Of course, that's just a small uh, example that I'm giving you. But it, my point is that we mustn't plunder struggle <coughs> to advance theory, but build on the testimony, testimony of the impressed. And the tribunal that we were... Organized. It was a really defining moment for me. It was so emotional, and I want to end with this quote. The tribunal provides a space to come without shame or fear, to express hope, the affirmation of humanity through collectives of solidarity. Thank you. I'm sorry, I rushed through it all. Thank you so much, Liz, for your uh, such an inspiring uh, presentation. Now we move to Federico, and he might appear. So, 
So now we leave the floor to Federico Oliveri from the University of Pisa. Now we will be able to see him on the screen. I will briefly introduce him. Uh, he is a research fellow at the Legal School of the University of Camerino. Here he is. And researcher at the Indisciplinary Center Sciences for Peace of the University of Pisa. He is a legal theorist, so an Italian philosopher del diritto who graduated and also got his PhD from, uh, in philosophical disciplines from the Scuola Normale Superiore. Uh, for 10 years, he coordinated research projects at the Council of Europe in Strasbourg, dealing with the fight against racial discrimination. He carries out research on citizenship, rights, migration, racism, and labor exploitations, applying theories and methods of philosophy and sociology of law. He has published on the topic of migrant struggles in Italy and racialization in times of crisis, and is also the author of Conflitti di Cittadinanza, Citizenship Conflicts. Uh, so Federico, the floor is yours. You have uh, about 20, 25 minutes. Thank you so much. I will share the screen with you, so you can follow me in the presentation. So here you are. Um, well, um, I will start with uh, the points uh, finally made by Lise, which I'm very uh, pleased to, to meet, even if at a distance. Uh, these opening questions uh, start with uh, some you know, of strict actuality. Uh, I will try to made some point on the differential mobility regimes at the time of Russia-Ukraine war, and asking this uh, almost simple question, are we uh, witnessing a racist implementation of race-blind migration policies, or are we uh, witnessing the legal production of racialized subjectivity at the borders? Mm. Is this something extraordinary or rather ordinary? Uh, then I will <coughs> present uh, some ideas uh, around what I call the race border nexus. Uh, and uh, I uh, assume that, that this nexus can be <coughs> presented, uh, formalized, uh, with the help of three uh, interconnected propositions. Uh, the first, that uh, racism is the result of racialization processes. The second is that what I call bordering powers uh, produce migrants as subaltern subjectivities. And third, that these bordering powers function as dispositives of racialization and produce systemic racism. So I uh, have to say that I wouldn't be able to, uh, to rise these uh, issues without experiences of resistances uh, <clears throat> enforced by migrants themselves uh, who resist uh, to bordering powers uh, and uh, through border struggle uh, we can really understand and contest uh, this kind of uh, racialization processes which are taking place at the borders and uh, with migrants shaping a, a, a new uh, anti-racist agenda. Uh, I will leave you then with some open questions uh, around the possibility uh, to uh, constitutionalize uh, the bordering powers, uh, to limit powers of state over borders, and of course the, the big question, who uh, can or should uh, cross this new frontier of constitutionalization. I would say that this is the big uh, struggle we have in front of us uh, as legal theorists and uh, anti-racist activists. So uh, let's start with this uh, differential mobility regimes we are seeing, uh, especially in the first weeks of the Russia-Ukraine war. As you all know, uh, we saw many uh, episodes of uh, stopping and turning back African, Asian, Middle East students escaping from Ukraine. And uh, uh, they witnessed uh, that uh, many officials, especially 
at the Polish border uh, didn't allow them to board trains out of the region. So here we have uh, the declaration of uh, one of the students uh, to NBC News. Uh, I quote, I was like, you are picking only white people. And the reaction, the response of officials was uh, Ukrainians only. So the answer was, you say Ukrainians only, but I don't see you picking, uh, checking passports, I see you picking white people only. So this is a very open uh, racist uh, practices at the borders. But my uh, assumption is that this is the <clears throat> result of a more structural problem of, uh, uh, let's say, um, racist design of all our uh, uh, migration policies. And so uh, let's discuss very briefly uh, the, the now enforced temporary protection directive uh, passed on uh, the 4th March uh, 2002 uh, to respond to the sudden large-scale displacement from Ukraine. Just four critical remarks uh, which highlight the race border nexus. Uh, the swift activation of the uh, temporary protection directive stands in strict contradiction uh, with the lack of common responses, let's say so, is a, an euphemism, uh, to large-scale forced displacement from other countries, uh, Syria, Libya, and Afghanistan. Uh, second point, second remark, uh, member states an option to not apply the directive regime to non-Ukrainian third country nationals. Mm? This is very important. Third point, uh, this free movement regime, uh, which is just for Ukrainians, stands in contradiction with the Dublin regulation that, as all would know, opposes so-called secondary movements of asylum seekers and refugees within the EU. So you have to stay and apply for asylum in the first country of entry. And secondary movements are strictly uh, decouraged. Last point, but very uh, dramatic, let's say, uh, since the application of the directive, at least 113 people were left to die, literally, in the Mediterranean, and no uh, real concern uh, raised in the public debate around this, uh, this uh, death. So these are just some points uh, which uh, uh, suggest how this race border nexus is very uh, actual and continuous and uh, ask for uh, a, a deeper understanding and, of course, also a, a, a political, social uh, reaction. Uh, so let's go to uh, what I call my thesis on the race border nexus. The first one concerns uh, this very well-known uh, to the time uh, concept as a racialization. So, uh, in a post-racial uh, uh, racism, uh, like the contemporary one, where uh, race and, and racists even are uh, disappeared apparently, uh, uh, racialization uh, became a, a very uh, useful, I would say, a key concept for understanding race in general and post-racial racism in particular. Uh, let's just uh, remind all of us what we intend by uh, racialization. Uh, the process of the construction and reproduction of power relations between groups and members uh, ascribed to those groups uh, which are differentiated according to race, of course, but also, and this is very important to this concept, also according to race-similar uh, identity markers. Uh, uh, I mean by these uh, uh, notions uh, like uh, migration status, for instance, or religion, uh, or uh, ethnic groups, or uh, language, other uh, uh, identity uh, markers can uh, function as race, with the same uh, naturalized, essentialized 
fixed uh, approach to identities. This is uh, uh, the result of at least five uh, operations, the social uh, operations. The first is, uh, of course, unilateral identification and categorization of people according to these identity markers. Then the devaluation of these the identity markers and therefore the inferiorization of people uh, according to these markers. Following this uh, inferiorization, the discrimination at legal level or at social level, exclusion, segregation, then public discourses and let's say lay theories trying to justify the use and the legitimacy of these uh, identity markers. Uh, last but not least, violence, uh, police violence, uh, visible and invisible violence on people who just try to live in, in peace and just ask for respect and dignity. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say also uh, race in the new form uh, taken through uh, racialization uh, continue to play uh, important functions in, uh, in our uh, context, in, in capitalist liberal societies. Uh, let's just mention the main three of this. Uh, first, the division, the certification and exploitation of labor force. Uh, second, uh, the unification of our uh, more and more fragmented and unequal societies around strong identity lines uh, opposing us to them. And third, uh, the substitution of class struggle and struggles for rights with ethnic conflict on scarce resources. Uh, so through these three functions, we can see how much racialization is uh, embedded uh, to neoliberal societies and is an essential part of his uh, function. Mm -hmm. uh, let's come to bordering powers. Uh, what uh, are these powers? Uh, are the powers to which uh, a sovereign authority uh, establishes, regulates and controls various types of borders? Huh? Uh, so this is the um, field uh, what uh, legal uh, theorists call migration, and not uh, only them, uh, call uh, migration and citizenship laws. Uh, and uh, these powers are uh, uh, enforced uh, in order to govern uh, human mobility in relation to a given political community and a given territory. Uh, uh, what is, I would say, very <coughs> key to this notion uh, is that uh, law, uh, laws in general, uh, of course also migration and citizenship laws, have a strong uh, performative power. Uh, this means that laws produce social, social reality and produce common sense. Uh, to our purpose, this means something very simple uh, and, and dramatic at the same time, that is that uh, people and groups who are inferior and unequal by law are seen and treated as inferior and unequal by nature. Uh, uh, so bordering powers uh, produce literally uh, uh, migrants as subaltern subjectivities. Uh, and here um, uh, you have my uh, theoretical proposal, uh, a, a map uh, of uh, bordering powers uh, classified in uh, two main categories, five powers of status uh, dealing with uh, the legal status of people uh, that are uh, citizenship, of course, uh, permit to stay, uh, registered residence, what we call residenza, the anagrafica, uh, civic identification, that is the um, differential statuses linked to a differential access to rights, and uh, procedures of regularization, which is the contrary and the uh, opposite uh, uh, trend of regularization. Uh, 
uh, states can make people irregular, but also uh, periodical sanatorium, yeah, uh, make people become regular again, or for the first time. These are powers of status. Then are uh, other five powers uh, of control, border control. This means, uh, for instance, uh, the authorization to entry, uh, to visas, uh, mostly, or uh, other uh, legal instruments, uh, the power to expel and deport, uh, the power to prevent to entry, uh, to push back, the power to confine in uh, so-called uh, administrative uh, uh, facilities for, for people uh, awaiting expulsions, uh, and uh, last but not least, criminalization and punishment for uh, crime that only uh, strangers, only migrants can commit because they are linked to uh, migration policies. Mm. Uh, also, these uh, bargaining powers uh, uh, have uh, uh, some political, socio-economic key functions, uh, which are very close to uh, those of uh, racialization. Maybe the one I would like to add is the fact that borders are uh, a business for those who militarize borders, but also for those who make uh, uh, the, 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 the asylum seekers as a source of, uh, of profits. Mm. Uh, so, um, the third uh, of my thesis is the uh, synthesis of the uh, first two. Uh, that is, migratory status uh, works, functions uh, as a substitute for race, or uh, literally is a kind of new uh, uh, I mean by this that uh, the fact of being made into a migrant by borders uh, uh, constitutes an identity marker, uh, likely to start a process of racialization. And, and we, uh, here I am very glad to, to, to meet Liz because uh, I know through, through her work uh, and uh, to the work of Simananda the notion of racism, which is very, very <coughs> Uh, key for my for my work. Uh, so, uh, migratory status functions as a new race, literally, uh, uh, alone or in connection with other race similar markers, uh, color, mm, traditionally, but also religion, and uh, this mentioned, of course, uh, Islamophobia, culture, language, etc. Plus, let's not forget this, of course, class and gender. So you have a, a really uh, 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 um, interplay, uh, uh, an intersection of multiple uh, um, identity markers uh, which produce uh, subaltern uh, subjectivities, in this case, racialized subjectivities. Uh, so uh, from this point of view, migration and citizenship policies are racist by design. It's not just that uh, people, so-called street corner politicians, border policies, and so on, are racist, or that our uh, politicians are racist. Uh, the very uh, design of these policies produce the racist uh, effects. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I will take just a few moments to uh, make some example, uh, taking the first uh, power of status, that is uh, citizenship, and the first uh, power of control, that is the entry in the country. So citizenship can, see, can be seen as the fundamental voting power uh, and the clearest expression of what uh, Abdel Malek Sayyad called state thought. Uh, uh, it produced in itself uh, hierarchies uh, between those who are rightly and legitimately here and those who, one way or another, have disrupted the, the natural national order by crossing borders. Mm. Um, even the notion, uh, apparently neutral, as uh, naturalization is not uh, as uh, neutral as we can see, uh, because it's uh, a process of becoming natural. Uh, 
which implies that only being part of a nation is the natural status of people. And, and this is, per se, uh, I would say, uh, uh, racializing this narrative. Uh, just mention some elements, some recurring elements in the uh, highly uh, uh, variety of, of uh, citizenship laws. Uh, mostly, uh, uh, citizenship is uh, presented as a reward for cultural assimilation, for not being a burden, being a threat, etc. Uh, the procedures are very selective, are often very arbitrary and time consuming. And in many uh, uh, legal systems now, citizenship uh, acquired through uh, naturalization is revocable. Uh, so all these elements produce, uh, even for people who become finally a citizen of the state uh, where they choose to live, uh, something which produces a differential and subordinated kind of inclusion. Uh, so uh, let's be clear, becoming citizen is not the end of discrimination, it's the beginning of new forms of discrimination. Uh, second example of uh, borders as a, a racial dispositive, uh, the example of the authorization, uh, authorization to entry. Mm -hmm. Uh, which um, is enforced mostly through uh, the exhibition of passport and visas. So in this map, uh, uh, produced and uh, updated by these very interesting initiatives, uh, uh, which you can uh, follow online, this is the passport index, uh, you can see the different power that our uh, passports uh, have across the globe. Uh, in uh, your uh, color, you have the most powerful passports, that is, passports who open uh, without uh, the obligation of visas in most countries, and with darker uh, colors, the, uh, the, the passports who are uh, uh, less powerful, because uh, people uh, with those passports need to ask for visas uh, more than the others. And this, according to Van Hootum, uh, who is uh, using uh, some uh, categories taken from Balibar, uh, it's uh, really a status of global apartheid, because people are uh, classified according to their uh, power to move, or uh, they are obliged to stay where they, uh, by chance, uh, they, they, they were born. Uh, so this is a very visual and clear uh, um, <clears throat> representation of how uh, uh, borders produce hierarchies of uh, uh, humanities and a regime of global apartheid. So, if all this is uh, true, um, we can use border uh, struggles as a method, uh, as a uh, valuable uh, standpoint for understanding uh, uh, racism, uh, racism and build an anti-racist agenda. Uh, because migrants are not only racialized, uh, racialized subjectivities, but also subjectivities who resist to border and bordering powers. Uh, so uh, I would say border struggles are uh, anti-racist struggles. Uh, maybe today one of the clearest examples of anti-racist uh, struggles. Huh? Uh, let's um, come to the end and just sketch uh, this anti-racist agenda uh, uh, developed having in mind border struggles. First, I would say uh, our priority today is to claim respect and effectiveness of asylum as a fundamental right. Uh, in fact, asylum is the most powerful limitation uh, of bordering powers, as it imposes uh, obligations on states and non-refoulement, uh, which is the uh, key notion notion of uh, asylum law uh, is uh, today recognized as use cogents, which is 
a kind of uh, international law uh, which cannot be uh, changed uh, by, by states. Uh, so uh, this is also why uh, in the last decades asylum is systematically under attack because it is the, uh, the exception uh, to the almost absolute power of state to control borders. So it's why we have to stress asylum as a fundamental right. Then, uh, inspired by asylum, uh, we should claim freedom of movement and access to citizenship as fundamental rights as uh, asylum is. Uh, last but not least, uh, uh, if it's true that uh, both racialization and borders uh, play important socio-economic and political functions, we have to uh, um, promote uh, as much as possible uh, unity, also as, as Liz said, unity in the labor force uh, uh, and promote struggles against exploitation and precarity, uh, unite communities uh, around struggles for basic needs and rights, uh, education, health, housing, environmental issues, and uh, last but not least, and this is my last um, point, uh, build coalitions uh, across uh, Russia lines, including different uh, migratory status, because as um, racialization and war produce divisions, uh, artificial divisions, uh, we have to uh, follow the opposite uh, trend and try to unite and to uh, put in place again uh, 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 struggles uh, on rights plus struggles instead of uh, false uh, um, ethnic uh, conflicts around uh, scarce resources. We have to say that resources are there, but they are mostly used for other uh, aims. Uh, last for arms and uh, armament. So there are alter alternatives and uh, uh, migrants can, uh, with us, uh, build uh, an anti-racist agenda with, which will really contribute to make our societies more uh, in line with their uh, formal principles of justice and equal recognition of uh, social dignity. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the attention. Federico, we know that you have to abandon us <laughs> because you have academic commitments. Um, but of course, you can join any time, also in the afternoon. Now uh, we have the talk of Angelica Pesarini who recently took up a new position as assistant professor in race and cultural studies, race and diaspora and Italian studies at the University of Toronto. Her work seeks to expand the field of black Italia, focusing on dynamics of race, gender identity, and citizenship. Interested in racialization of the political discourse on immigration, she's among the co-founders of the Black Mediterranean Collective, which recently published the Black Mediterranean Bodies, Borders and Citizenship with Palgrave Macmillan. By the way, you can find it in our library here in Florence. Her academic work has been published widely, both in English and Italian. She is amongst the author of the anthology Future, in Il Domani Narrato dalle Voci di Oggi, curated by Ijaba Shego. She co-translated into uh, Italian under Commons, Fugitive Planning and Black Study, uh, published in Italian by Tamu and Archive Books, and Blues Legacies and Black Feminism, Angela Davis, Edizione Allegre, forthcoming. She is currently writing a monograph investigating the use of race, performativity in colonial and postcolonial Italy. Angelica, the floor is yours. Grazie. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Thank you so much for um, this invitation. I was, uh, when I spoke to Chiara, uh, uh, I was really um, happy to uh, we can create these spaces of dialogue where <clears throat> we can try to maybe uh, challenge a bit these boundaries uh, between academia and activism. So I'm really glad that today we have a, um, 
a round table with the, um, the activists. Actually, it would have been nice to be here all on the same table, in a round table, but I know uh, we can dream about it. <laughs> but it's really, it's really good that you organized this. I'm really happy to be here. Um, so I'm coming directly from Toronto, so I'm still a bit uh, in the clouds, um, so I'm sorry. Uh, I hope that uh, my presentation will make sense. Um, it's really connected, actually. Uh, I wanted to uh, thank also Liz and Federico because everything they said so far really makes sense also for um, what I'm about to say. Um, as Chiara mentioned, I tried to work on race uh, in Italy um, because this is also my um, personal experience as a, as a black Italian woman. Uh, since a very young age, I've always been confronted with uh, questions that um, uh, other people were not questioned. Uh, so, mm, wow, where, where are you from? And so when I was saying, well, I'm from, I'm from Rome. No, no, but where are you really from? So these, yeah. these questions, or why do we speak such a good Italian? Where did I learn? And so on. And so I... Um, I started to think why I was asked this question since I was very young. Uh, I knew uh, I was Italian, but I was not a colorblind child, so I could see very well that I was the only one. I was a, a kid a long time ago uh, in Reggio Emilia, so uh, I could see that I was surrounded by this uh, ocean of whiteness, and so uh, these questions too made me kind of um, think about my identity and I realized that there was a missing link in my uh, identity formation that was actually Italian colonialism. Um, despite my family history originate from that period, I didn't study that at school very much uh, or at all. And so um, somehow through academia I found a space where I could investigate more these questions I had, not only about my uh, private family history, but, but in general about being Italian and being uh, non-white Italian. What, what does it mean to have to carry on this identity? And so I started to um, study Italian colonialism, especially during my PhD um, at the University of Leeds, where Remy and Laura, the author of the book, you showed we were doing a PhD together, so it's really a circle, right? Um, and so I started to investigate the colonial experience on looking about uh, genders, uh, specifically um, the mixed race identities. And so this is how my research started to um, develop. Um, so citizenship, uh, the citizenship law is crucial during the colonial period and uh, that's why it's so important to study Italian colonialism because we really understand many of the things that we see today, how they are, uh, they come from, from that past, uh, from the liberal period actually. We always think about the fascist period but the liberal period is even more prominent uh, in a way. And so um, with my colleague we thought in Tori we started to um, think about this a bit more uh, in depth um, and, and we write together um, a paper that I would like to um, comment here with you today. Thinking about race, mm, why it's so difficult to talk about race in Europe? This is a word that we cannot say and so we, we, we why we cannot say this word, why it's problematic, what are the implications of mentioning this race. So how can you be anti-racist if you don't use and you don't mention this big elephant in the room that is called race. And so we notice how, um, for example, uh, what the European governments are trying to do about that. In 2018, we know that France uh, voted to remove the word race um, out from the constitution uh, and the rationale behind uh, this act uh, was that there is only one race, the human race, uh, and so um, it's racist to talk about race. And so the solution was to remove the word race. So this shows us that uh, these issues uh, with terminology that is already complicated in English become even more uh, tangled and complex in non-English uh, speaking context. Uh, so categories like race or even mixed race cannot be easily transposed or translated into other contexts where the same term may operate in different ways. 
Uh, in most cases, continental European countries added the term race to their post-war uh, constitutions as a safeguard against racist ideas and acts. Uh, with the consolidation of peace and the rule uh, of law across the continent, uh, these same countries started to believe that it was now safe to eliminate race from politics and public policies, and also wondering whether a colorblind approach would be better suited to prevent future racial tensions. In this respect, uh, David Theo Goldberg suggests the reason why race does no longer exist in Europe through a brilliant idea, the racial Europeanization. And according to Goldberg, uh, race denial in Europe is wishful but unattainable, a frustrating desire buried and at the same time alive. And he writes, uh, race in Europe has left odorless traces but once suffocating in the wake of their at once denied racinous stench. So this idea that race, like um, Stuart Hall taught us, is a floating signifier, right? So it floats in the air. We can smell the stench, but we cannot grab it. And so in this vein, race has become a taboo term. Uh, across Europe, the word race is not usually considered acceptable, uh, given its biological implications and its connections with the guilt of the Holocaust. Uh, as a consequence, uh, in most uh, continental Europe, countries do not uh, collect census or other administrative data based on the race or ethnicities of their citizens. However, um, as the social sciences explain, race is a social construct, uh, but inevitably continues to impact on the lives of those who fall into the categories uh, otherness. In this sense, the absence of such uh, targeted data uh, creates a difficult conundrum, because on the one hand, it ensures that states classify count and administer their people in a univers universalistic manner. On the other, it deprives policymakers and researchers of a tool to uh, monitor and address the implications of racism. And so within this context, Italy is particularly interesting. Um, in fact, Italy, um, Italian governments at all levels, as well as bureaucratic agencies, cannot discriminate uh, against people on the basis of their race, sex, and religion, as affirmed by the third article of the Constitution, uh, which ratifies that all citizens have equal social dignity and are equal before the law without distinction. Um, sex, race, language, religion, political opinion, personal and social <coughs> condition. As a result, there are not, we don't have ethnic statistics in the national uh, official data, nor public policies that target groups defined by race. By the same token, even when Italian policymakers realize that race and ethnicity matter, this doesn't translate into specific anti-racist laws and policies, like maybe in the UK. Uh, Anti-racism norms are incorporated into pieces of legislation addressing social hatred and social violence in general. Um, and so overall this process doesn't uh, this process doesn't favor the development of a race conscious society and institutions um there has been uh, new research on uh, racial relations in italy um this has been uh, has been really important uh, but uh, often these contributions focused on the period of the liberal and fascist state uh, and they brought clearer uh, understanding of the importance of racism in the relationship between sovereignty and citizenship yet the impact uh, of this research on civil society has been quite minimal. Mm, and so we were wondering uh, why. 
Um, talking about citizenship, so we know um, I was mentioning how the liberal period was uh, in a way even more pivotal than the fascist uh, period in terms of uh, thinking about citizenship. So in 1861, uh, the newly unified Italian state uh, was faced with the question of imagining uh, the nation and defining the uh, citizenry. Through the adoption of the Civil Code of 1865, the so-called uh, Codice Pisanelli, uh, Articles 1 to 15 uh, of the first section discipline the norms of acquisition, loss, and transmission of Italian citizenship. The juridical configuration of Italian citizenship reflected the power related citizenship. The juridical configuration of Italian citizenship reflected the power relations of the time, and I quote, as a perfectly legitimate form of representing uh, the people by its elite. Mm -hmm. So we see how it's a um, process that was um, artificially made and uh, decided at the, at the top. In this vein, uh, the jurist and political class that laid the foundation of the unified state in uh, Pasquale Stanislao Mancini and its main uh, champion, uh, the juridical thought uh, underlying the code uh, came especially from his work. Mancini had theorized uh, the coincidence of origin and blood as the constitutive element of the nation. In Mancini's view, the nation resembled first and foremost as a family, and blood ties were the cornerstone upon which statehood was to be founded. Consistently, Jus Sanguinis became the principal criterion regulating the transmission and conservation of citizenship. So if Italy is a, Italy is a family, what keep family members together? Blood. Mm? And so this is how uh, we have uh, Jus Sanguinis. However, this essentially static conception of citizenship uh, was soon challenged by two events. On the one hand, the immigration of Italian national in massive numbers, and on the other, the participation of the country in the colonial scramble uh, for Africa. Both events implied a mixing of blood with different populations. <coughs> um, in particular, the mobility of Italian nationals seeking better life and opportunities abroad exposed the conflicting interactions between the rationale of Italian citizenship and the nationality laws of the countries uh, to which Italians were directed to, such Brazil, uh, Argentina, France, uh, the United States. Um, the latter implemented policies uh, of ex Expedited naturalization by residency and applied the all of you solely uh, to the second generation immigrant, which stood in contrast to the Italian citizenship as acquired and transmitted by blood. And very often, uh, actually, the uh, receiving countries were imposing mm, their citizenship on the new arrival. And so there was this conundrum in which uh, Italy was losing many people, if we think about it, between 1890 and 1916, out of 38 million Italian, 14 million left. Mm, so half of the country left in like 30 years. Um, <clears throat> and so we can see how uh, Jus Sanguinis worked in this sense. So even it didn't matter where you were born, uh, why you left Italy, you were still Italian. Um, so even though the main rationale behind this legislation was to advocate and support the idea of a grassroots diasporic um, expansionism, and the law didn't include any mention of race, this doesn't mean that its underpinning ideology was immune from forms of racial hierarchization, especially of the Orientalist kind. Um, for example, Senator Raffaele Garofalo from Naples contested that in 1912 law was inspired by a principle of inclusion and would have entitled certain foreigners to naturalize without according to the Italian state. And so um, he said, 
I would like to know why it should be allowed to grant so easily the Italian citizenship to an Armenian, an Albanian, a Greek, a Levantine, because it will be exactly the Levantines, the Greeks, and I shall add the Armenians and the Albanians, those who aspire to Italian citizenship. It will certainly not be the English, nor the French, nor the Germans, nor the Spaniards, nor the Russians. So our stance should be reversed. Given a category system, instead of reason for inclusion, we should pinpoint reasons for exclusion. When an Armenian or an Albanian has been for the appointed time in Italy for his affair or for his amusement without doing anything in favor of the country, he will tell you, I have resided for five years in Italy. I wish therefore to become an Italian citizen. How will you exclude him if he has not committed any crime? So, 1912. Mm, so we can see how the discussions we are having today, how to prevent people from getting uh, um, citizenship, was uh, an old uh, thought. But we're talking about Italians. Mm? And so uh, Italians and race have a diff very different and difficult relationship because they had to struggle for their whiteness. Mm? And so overtly racist discourses based on, based on biological differences was particularly complicated in Italy, as illustrated by Eliza Wong in her study of race and nation building in liberal Italy. As she says, in a country that had been peopled by numerous migratory groups from North Africa, Greece, the Mediterranean Basin, and Eastern Europe. Certainly, the idea that one race encompassed all of Italy was easily disproved with a review of the history of Italian settlement. At the same time, the imperialist enterprises of the Italian national state um, <clears throat> provided the opportunity for a colonialist discourse founded on the exaltation of blood and race. And so here is when the colonial time really become important. Um, unfortunately, I don't have now the time to make uh, <laughs> the history of Italian colonialism, but I would like to, to just give you some ideas about citizenship and how it was uh, regulated. Um, just an idea, in 1905, uh, so the first colony, uh, Eritrea, was created in 1890. So in 1905, more than 2,000 Italians lived in Eritrea. Uh, very few women, lots of men, uh, without their uh, wives or single. And so a number, a uh, very high number of uh, interracial relationship giving birth to the first black Italians, hmm? uh, so-called Metici. Uh, these were people that, if recognized by their fathers because of you sanguinis, they were Italian hmm? at all level. Um, and so this is very different from other uh, colonial systems. In 1931, in, in Eritrea there are approximately uh, 4,200 people, and a third of the children born are mixed. And so this uh, tell us how many relationships uh, were going on. And, and so it's very important for the colonial government to think about citizenship and what to do with, all, with these black children who have Italian blood. Um, the first attempt was in 1909, so very early the Codice Civile per la Colonia Eritrea. There was an article in this Codice uh, that stated that in case of unknown parents, a child born in the colonies could gain Italian citizenship if their physical features showed the presence of Italian blood. So this is the first time in which already we regulate citizenship based on blood, and we are in 1909. In 1933, so we are in the fascist time, uh, the fascists look at that code. And so there is the or ordinamento organico per l'Eritrea e la Somalia. And what happened here? The article 18 of the law, 999, stated that mixed race children born in the colonies and recognized by their father had the juridical right to be considered Italian. Those who, were, um, who didn't have a father 
could gain Italian citizenship if they, um, they were able to show on their body, sign, and they quote, of clear racial intermixing with a member of the white race. 1933. So think also, big jump, 2018, 15 gennaio, uh, 15th of January 2018, Attilio Fontana talked about the white race. Hmm? Okay. So how these concepts and word travel. Um, then we have the racial laws. 1937 is the first racial laws banning interracial relationships. Uh, 1938, we have the Manifesto della Razza and anti-Semitic laws. In 1940, we have a specific set of norms that strip mixed race uh, children of their rights to become Italian citizenship because they have uh, black blood. So they are blacks, they are Africans, and they cannot get Italian citizenship anymore. Uh, these uh, laws will uh, then uh, be cancelled in 1952. Um, so, um, race in Italy today. As mentioned, we don't talk about it, we don't measure it. Uh, if we think about the uh, census released by ISTAT, we don't have any mention of ethnicity. There are only two questions uh, related to your citizenship, if you think about it. There is a question that is, what is your citizenship? And another question that says, have you had Italian citizenship since birth? By these two questions, we are already able to separate real Italians from foreigners. Uh, but these uh, uh, labels are very, are very broad. Um, and uh, this question are also very interesting when analyzed in light of Italian citizenship law itself, whose implicit references to categories such as blood, race, and purity are quite striking. So we know that the current citizenship law, uh, 91-92, based on your sanguinis, uh, is, um, uh, has uh, many limitations for those who don't have Italian blood. Uh, these uh, juridical practices at the moment affect um, approximately 900,000, 1 million children born on Italian soil to foreign parents. And la owing to their lack of right blood, they are not granted citizenship at birth, but are instead deemed outside the nation on a number of levels. In fact, let's think about an hypothetical um, Amir, born in Rome, right? From Pakistani parents who speaks um, Italian, who has attended Italian schools, who maybe have been to Pakistan just for holiday. Well, Amir is not an, entitled to apply to Italian citizenship before he is 18. In the meantime, he resides in Italy with the permesso di soggiorno, a uh, short term visa, that he must regularly renew. When he turns 18, Amin will only have 12 months to apply for citizenship and will have to prove that he has continuously lived on Italian soil. Even when uh, people like Amir fulfill these requirements, well, they're not granted citizenship due to a number of reasons, ranging from omission of a residency change, uh, notification, um, sorry, ranging from omission of residency change notification, to an awareness of the procedure. And in fact, many people uh, prefer to wait to be 28 and be naturalized Italian rather than going through this very uh, uh, difficult, expensive and long procedure. There are a number of limitations. Pe people without Italian citizenship cannot practice certain professions, including medical and juridical professions and job in the public sector. Also, uh, lack of uh, mobility, certain mobility, and also um, psychological difficulties, being born in a country that doesn't see you as belonging to the country. So to conclude, uh, what I tried to highlight was that the erasure of the, um, the erasure of state classification of race and ethnicity supposedly based on principle of egalitarianism and universalism is problematic for and detrimental for a few reasons. Firstly, the erasure of race on the basis of equality among human beings 
end up paradoxically reinforcing dynamics of inequality based precisely along racial lines and racialized views of identity. As a direct consequence, color blindness in relation to racial statistics not only contributes to the perpetuation of white privilege, but also widens the color line divide and enhances systemic racism. It is the analysis of the racial data that tell us that not all citizens are equal before the law nor have the same opportunities. For example, in the US, we know that uh, black people are three times more likely to be poor than white people, earn on average 40% less, receive an inferior education, and are the target of racial profiling and police brutality, are arrested more frequently, uh, prosecuted and incarcerated more frequently. Rather than using race and ethnicity to monitor disadvantage and discrimination, European countries have adopted an approach in fighting racism that might be labeled anti-racist policies without race, meaning that anti-discrimination and anti-racist policies are addressed without using racial categorization. This also means that the erasure of race from the legal and normative anti-racist European framework deprives policymakers and researchers of essential tools that could be used to analyze and tackle racism. This applies also in the case of Italy and the way the country does or does not engage with racism. However, the core problem is not in the inappropriate or insufficient methods to tackle racism, but in the saliency of race and the racialization of the national identity. Concepts of race and blood, in conjunction with the implicit idea of whiteness, have been historically fundamental in the creation of a collective national identity. New scholarship on the race identity citizenship nexus as added to the analysis of the country's historical, societal, and juridical developments. Attempts at self-reflection as a nation and the acknowledgement of the colonial past have pushed for a decolonization of processes of knowledge production. Nonetheless, we've seen what happened in the past few years. If we think about the uh, Salvini decree, 2018, that, that the approval of that decree was uh, quite uh, what Federico was saying. Uh, the most powerful limits of bordering power, asylum. And so, more research on this issue may eventually result in a serious shift in understanding the connection between race, identity, and citizenship in Italy in order to obtain lasting institutional and cultural change. Uh, I hope we will do in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angelica. Um, we have time now for the Q&A session. So we are half an hour or even 40 minutes. Uh, so if anybody wants to intervene, to comment, I mean, feel free to do it. The idea of this workshop, as uh, Angela explained, is to have a, like a floor where to discuss issues of race, ethnicity, and reflect upon what is going on also in Italy. Also being inspired by what is going on also outside of Italy. So we wanted to take this moment to reflect all together and therefore feel free to ask questions in a free manner. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to the three presenters. I have a question, I mean, maybe just to break the ice uh, for, uh, for Angelica. More, uh, it's not a proper academic question, it's more like a... Uh, <laughs> 
also a curiosity, I guess. Um, I was wondering, I mean, because we know that uh, you recently moved to, to Canada. And so I wanted to ask you if you, and before you were living here in Florence, uh, you noticed like any difference uh, in society, but I guess also as an academic, uh, in terms of what you, you, you before you called uh, a race conscious uh, society. Grazie, thank you for the, the question. Uh, yes, I've been, uh, I recently moved to Canada. Uh, I've been living in Florence for the past five years. Uh, and then I went to Toronto in November. Um, so it was a very um, intense experience. I went because the Italian department in, at the University of Toronto created a new profile in order to have issues of race within Italian studies. And so this already you know, uh, tells you a lot about the ways in which uh, we can approach issues of Italy and Italy's uh, within certain departments. I, I think one of the major problems we have in Italy is the lack of uh, interdisciplinarity. So, um, many subjects are seen as pure and in sort of Artimenti um, stagni, which I don't know how to translate in, in English, but we don't collaborate. Um, we see interdisciplinarity as a sort of contamination that uh, um, you know, uh, is, is seen as not productful. I think it's really the opposite. I think interdisciplinarity is fundamental. Uh, contamination is fundamental. And so this is one of the main um, differences I noted in, for example, in the US and Canada, also in the UK, there is much more, um, when, we, when we talk about knowledge production, I think there is more interdisciplinarity. Now, Canada, um, when I was saying that I was moving to Canada, everyone was, wow, Canada, the heaven of you know multiculturalism and, and so on. Yeah, well, if you dig a bit, you see how neoliberal multiculturalism is very prominent. Uh, in talking about citizenship is use, um, uh, use it's all, uh, is not use sanguine, is use solely. And so this is why um, there, is, there are so many people in Canada that can be Canadian and uh, non-white. Non However, Canada was based on a uh, genocide. So the native populations were exterminated. And still today, we can see a proper colonial uh, settler moves and, and policies going on. When I arrived in Canada, in the reservation, indigenous people didn't have tap water. It was all uh, contaminated due to the mining uh, um, actions made in their land. And so, um, in terms of representation, it's very different. I, I see a lot of more, much more diversity, especially when you look around adverts. I notice, I remember once I was looking at a catalog, and in the sports section, the male section, the model was a, uh, a man on a wheelchair. Hmm? And so this shocked me a bit, because I've internalized, right, all these uh, codes of normality. And so seeing a uh, disabled model in the sports section, in the tracking section, was made me realize how, uh, how much I have internalized. So in terms of representation, you see every color, especially there is a lot of attention in representing every feature, every hair, every skin tone. Um, but obviously is a... Um, very neoliberal and capitalist society, and so uh, multiculturalism is also you. Um, uh, if there are no other questions now, I have also a comment. Um, also, stem research because I studied. Um, I mean, I'm an expert in the Western Balkans. And there, for instance, the issue of ethnicity and the categorization of ethnicity that is, has been reinforced after the, the Balkan Wars. 
produce discrimination and inequalities. Struggling to put together this idea of uh, uh, ethnicity and race, coming from studies where this is as a discrimination. Then also coming from a culture where, as you, as Angelica explained very clearly, the, the notion of race is a sort of taboo, struggle, but at the same time has been also witnessing the attempts to put date on the campaigns for citizenship rights or in the Black Lives Matter movement more recently which is something uh, surprising, I would say, for, for the Italian debate where the notion of race has not been uh, used. Also, I see, but maybe, um, maybe it's not correct, but I see a sort of attempt to translate those notions in the Italian culture. And maybe this attempt uh, uh, requires efforts on the sides of uh, activists, on the sides of, I mean, to produce cultural change, we also need to adopt this con concept, but also to adapt them uh, in a culture that consider them as a sort of um, uh, producing discrimination. So saying that a person is black in Italy is still considered that stressing a difference that if you are progressive enough, you won't stress. Uh, so how to put together all those uh, ideas? So how to introduce or how to talk about race uh, in anti-racism without uh, sounding uh, uh, naive and also without uh, discriminating. Oh. Uh, it's a question for both of you or also for uh, Considering the Italian context and also of course coming from the uh, how to introduce a notion of race in a debate which so far has somehow tried to avoid using the notion of race as a negative one. I think it would be interesting to, to, to hear your experience on the UK. But um, So in Italy, as you say, right, it's, it's very difficult to talk about certain things. Uh, people are scared to mention colors. And so um, paradoxically, we end up using uh, expressions that are much more offensive, like persona di colore, uh, rather than just say black, uh, which is very different from uh, people of color in, in the Anglophone terms, right? It's a very different thing. The translation is true, all of these concepts come from Anglophone context, so it's, it's very different, very different histories and very different um, uh, ways of interpreting uh, race due to this different colonial histories, for example. And so, as you say, we need to do a translation of certain concepts, not only a grammatical translation, but a, a semantic and cultural translation. So definitely we need more dialogue. We need to talk more about these things. And now, after, you know, uh, 25th of May 2020, mm, we, we, we've seen some shifting uh, we've seen some shifts going on. Uh, we have seen that, I don't know, I think there is this pre-George Floyd and post-George Floyd in the sense that now there is more, um, I, I notice more attention on certain things that before were not noticed, that before were not seen, that before they were not heard. Now there are more open ears and open eyes. Um, so that, that that's good, and we will see. I think in the afternoon today, with the with the activist table, all the work they've been doing to uh, to bring these new uh, words and these new concepts uh, in Italy. Concept that for some of us is our life experience, but for many people are still new. Talking about it is difficult. So when I talk about white privilege, very often people. Uh, tell me off, say, oh, but this doesn't belong to us in Italy. We are not racist. We are just ignorant. These things do not exist here. It's just the US. And so there is this denial, like everything that is 
racist or concerned race is about uh, about the US. So there is a lack of dialogue. There is a lack of maybe self-reflection on, on this uh, on this issue. Um, Acknowledge that talking about race is not easy, makes, uh, makes you feel uncomfortable, uh, but it's part of the process, I think, to feel uncomfortable because we're talking about social injustice, we're talking about structural, structural injustices that affect certain people, uh, there is a lot of guilt. Uh, um, so I think we really need to find ways to talk about all of this in um, respectful ways, but in order to... Uh, produce some sort of lasting social justice in a way we can carry on talking about anti-racism not mentioning what is race but I agree we can find new words maybe new terms we don't need to use the anglophone uh, term to talk about it a typical question Chiara finding it really difficult to know where to start in the answer. Um, I'll talk a little bit from the UK context where it's not, it's not difficult to talk about race, but it's difficult to have a conversation where everybody's on the same page. I think my answer is going to go on two directions. I'm going to go from the direction of where the state is coming from on race and then look at it from where the movements have been coming from, which will mean giving you a little bit of history. So I would say in the UK, paradoxically, in the mainstream of society, they talk about nothing but race, actually. Everything is viewed through the lens of race. We come to the bizarre conclusion that it's actually the minority communities who are racist against the white majority. That's the kind of sort of, you know, where we're getting to in the UK. So that kind of a little bit came out for sort of historical stuff that I wanted to explain in my presentation about we have this defining moment in the 1980s when a young black Caribbean boy was murdered on the streets of London. His name was Stephen Lawrence. And he was out quite, he was going home quite late at night with a friend and a gang of racists attacked them and he was murdered, the police came. Uh, he was dying on the street actually um, and the police came and asked his friends, well what are you doing out at night? So the implication was that they were up to some wrong. And so this was a very traumatic thing because the family of the boy who died wouldn't let go. They just campaigned and campaigned. But they were not the fam first family who'd suffered a loss of a loved one in a racist attack. These things had been going on in society, but this became the sort of pebble that started the avalanche. And there was so much endemic racism, structured racism within the police that was exposed at this inquiry where the judge-led judge, judge -led inquiry came out and said that we have institutional racism in the police. We amended our Race Relations Act to put a positive duty on all government institutions to, to monitor uh, discrimination and make sure that you didn't discriminate against particular groups. So that was kind of high point in the UK, in the sense a high point in terms of the the state, recognising that there was a problem. But basically, ever since then, it's gone downhill because they will say, we did that, you know, we did that, we've moved on, we're now post-racial, and um, there isn't a problem. So what happened was that we've got to a situation today where I think I mentioned we have this government-led inquiry, Commission for Race and Ethnic Disparities, and maybe this comes a little bit into your point, but they would say, they were saying now that 
there isn't structural racism, there is just ethnic disadvantage. There are different ethnic groups in society and some are doing better than others. So therefore, and this has got major implications for the university because now the government are telling the university and researchers, uh, you can't use terms like, we have the term, it's a very controversial term, I don't like it because it becomes an acronym called BAME, Black and Minority Ethnic. And people, to call people a BAME person, it's, I mean, you know, you're not a BAME person, you're a black person or you're a brown person or whatever. So people don't like that term. Another term is BME, black minority ethnic. But the useful thing of saying that is it allows you to explore a common experience of racism that affects all groups. The government is saying you cannot use that term now. You cannot say structural racism now. I mean, it's like a legal duty. You have to investigate all these ethnic disparities um, because if one group is doing better, like the Chinese, they do very well in the world education, and another group isn't doing well, like the Black Caribbean, it can't be institutional racism because one ethnicity is doing better than the other. So what they're doing is creating, just as we have a good migrant, bad refugee, we now have the, the good ethnic man minority, the bad ethnic minority, and they set up a league table. So that's what's happening in terms of the government. They're using ethnic differences to justify uh, structural racism, which we're not allowed to talk about. But at the same time, the sort of underbelly and the gnawing thing that's going on all the time in society is that these people, it's just this victim mentality, they're just victims, they're playing on our guilt, and and really it's, it's um, you know, white people who are, are, are the victims of this. And there's a funny, another example I saw, not in the UK context, which I thought was interesting, in terms of the Roma in the European Parliament. Recently, there was a big debate on International Roma Day, I think only last week, where the far-right bloc said... Um, why are we discussing the Roma? All this money that goes to the Roma should go to the Ukrainian refugees. And the, the European Parliament is institutionally racist against people who are not Roma. So this is, this is how the narrative goes. So that's one way of answering your question. Another way is to come from, from the struggle and how people um, try to find a common unity around definitions that help them express the, the, the common thread, what I wanted to talk about, the common thread in racism that everyone experiences. And I think here we're in a different, difficult period in the UK to be, because historically there was a kind of specific struggle in the UK in the 1970s and the 1980s where the term black was used as a political colour. Um, and so this isn't to say that there weren't differences between communities, but our colonial history was very much that, you know, and I completely agree with Angelica about how you've got to look at the colonial history. And in her presentation, what was fascinating for me was this whole concept of the liberal, you know, how the liberal racism it's always more two-faced, but it's just as, you know, it's obviously clear-cut with the fascists, but with the, you know, I think that's what you were saying about Canada and the, and the, the, the liberal racism that comes out of neoliberalism is a historical continuity with that liberal racism that founded the Italian state. Sorry, detour, I'm always doing this. I'm always going off on little passages. That's why when I'm in the car with my daughter, she begs me not to find a shortcut because I always get lost, sorry. So anyway, so go back. We have this common struggle around the notion of political black. So you had uh, mainly uh, the colonial relationship was England was the mother country, so we were different in that respect, that people had citizenship after the Second World War. Or, excuse me, they thought they had citizenship because we've had this big scandal around the Windrush generation, the Black Caribbean community, and mostly this effect, it impacted on people who were poor, working class, who, who, never, who perhaps didn't have a passport. And they, they, they came with a promise of citizenship, and then 30, 40 years suddenly, because of the changes in immigration law, they were under 
and many got deported back to, um, to the Caribbean. Many couldn't access. Elderly people suddenly overnight couldn't access healthcare. All this stuff. They might have worked for National Health Service all their lives. So anyway, there was this struggle around political black that united people, and very much, I think, came out of workplace struggles because uh, people came from the Indian subcontinent, they came from the former colonies in Africa, and they came from the black Caribbean countries, from the Caribbean. Um, so they united in the workplace around exploitation, and there was the notion of black is a political color. However, after there were major uprisings in, in the UK against the police in 1981 and 1985, that was the period when I became political. Um, my first um, uh, involvement in anti-racist struggles were in East London, where uh, self-defense movements were formed because young Asian kids couldn't go to school without being arrested, uh, without being attacked by the racists, and then they get arrested. So we had mass demonstrations, and that's I, I, how I got involved in, in anti-racism. And then I was lucky enough to get a job at the Institute and then they couldn't get rid of me. But so what happened after these uprisings in 81, huge uprisings against the police of Asian communities, African communities, African American communities. Um, we also had a colonial struggle in the north of Ireland, which was an anti-colonial, anti-racist struggle, but the Irish were white. But at the same time, they were, the first, you know, they were one of the first victims of, uh, of British, uh, British colonialism. So after 81, the government under Margaret Thatcher pumped a huge amount of money into the inner cities. They, they had launched an inquiry then, and the inquiry said, this is again coming back to the same thing, there is an institution of rise racism in the police. No, 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 but there are rotten apples in the police. And there is some evidence of discrimination, but you know it also works on the other side because black communities mistrust the police because of some of a few rotten bad apples and then they don't give them a good time. So there wasn't racism structured, but there was ethnic disadvantage. Again, we go back to ethnicity. So, so what do you do? There's ethnic disadvantage. We'll give uh, people a leg up as in the system. And this is where Sivanand and our director first made this comment like, we don't want crutches, don't break our legs in the first place, uh, as against that. But after 81, because all this money went in and they uh, created a lot of divisions in the community, this idea of political black disappeared. And we had much more sort of ethnic competition for resources. So we get to a point today, I think, when we're on an uptick in struggle, definitely in the UK, we're on a massive uptick in struggle. Um, not just Black Lives Matter, the stuff around policing is very, very positive what's happening. In the 80s, we have police monitoring groups all around the country. They disappeared. It's all starting up again. Remy and Laura, who Angelica mentioned, they're in the Northern Police Monitoring Group. And you may, may be academics, but they're also in police monitoring groups. We have all these police monitoring groups in, in London, all around the country. It's all coming back again. But there isn't, at the moment, a unifier in terms of a, a common concept that unifies us. We're still struggling to find that. We have a lot of industrial struggles. We have a lot of struggles of, of migrant uh, workers, of black workers. Um, again, this goes to neoliberalism, but often say they're working um, as cleaners in the National Health Service, but what they, they're contracted out. And it's mostly the black uh, and Eastern Europeans who are contracted out, so they don't have a regular contract. But we don't have a unifier at the moment. We're struggling with that. And we're often arguing with each other about terms, like uh, a lot of young people might like to use the term people of colour, but a lot of older black people don't like the term people of colour because of apartheid struggle, South Africa, the division between black and coloured, but also they think we're black, we're not, we're not coloured. So, so we have this moment where uh, it's looking positive but we, we still haven't really got the, vo the unifying vocabulary yet. And ethnicity is, is what, breaks, what breaks us down, and that's a state-led strategy to break struggle down through culture and ethnicity.
Uh, okay, I think there are a few questions from the public. Marco, you go ahead, then uh, Jacopo, and then... Right. So my question uh, is, is a bit long. <laughs> I'll try to connect. Uh, so I was struck by um, um, Angelica's return to the, to the definition of, of what makes a, this alliance a people, uh, what defines our citizenship. And, and I was struck by this attempt to find the positive element, right? And so blood becomes the most obvious one, the only one, even though it's very abstract, obviously, uh, that can hold um, people together. And uh, at the same time, the, the, the conception of the law, of the state in general, the modern state, is based on, on, a, on a negative principle, right? The state has to be equidistant from all citizens, right? Think about when you enter a, a court of justice, you cannot be judged because you're Muslim, because you're black, because you're white, right? So the, the state must be, to a certain extent, colorblind in order to, um, to be able to exercise, to apply the authority of the law in a fair and equal manner. Um, on the other hand, there's all these uh, positive actions that the state must undertake in order to break down barriers, right? Like the Article 3 of Italian Constitution, like the, the fact that, um, that we actively remove the barriers that uh, ensure the minorities, uh, even though that we don't use the term minorities, uh, but that there is no uh, substantive discrimination, right? So when, when, there, when Liz was referring to the fact that whites say that, um, that the state is racist against whites, is that they are appealing to that negative principle, right? They're saying if you, take, if you undertake a positive action for Romans, for women, for blacks, right, you are discriminating against me because you are basically going in that direction of saying you're, you're favoring somebody. You're not taking that neutral position, right? So I think that a lot of the tension uh, for, for anti-racist movements, but also for feminist movements, when, when you start, for, for example, demanding, this is something that we discuss also in academia, right? Quotas for women. Um, I tried to propose, for example, that in the admission test here at the Normale, there would be a question, uh, it's, not a, it's not the admission, it's those who apply to try to get in, uh, that there would be a, a questionnaire that is just sent to administration as it's done in Canada, in the US, in many other, in the UK, that would give us a sense of who is applying in order to see whether somebody gets discriminated, right? So a question I proposed was, what color do you identify with? <laughs> I was told that that was not an, an adequate question for the Italian context. I was not tell, told that by administration. I was told that by professors in this department. So uh, it's very interesting to me, right, that, that, we, that, we have this, that we try to make these attempts on the one hand, and on the other hand, we bump into this uh, kind of reaction that it, whether it's based on this negative conception of the state that is very foundational. So I was wondering whether you thought about this and uh, something that came up in any papers. <coughs> yes, I think it's a good idea that we collect some questions and then... Uh, okay. Well, first of all, thank you very much for all the interest, very interesting presentations. I really enjoyed them. And uh, I have a com com comment to Angelica. Uh, I wonder if, oh, maybe I wait just a second. <laughs> yeah, okay. I wonder if you could expand a little bit more on the role of race in the imagination of Italian national identity, because I'm very interested in this. And also because I do agree with you that Italianness established itself by mixing with racial identity, especially in the late years of the liberal era, and also even more in the fascist era, of course. <clears throat> but nonetheless, I do believe that Italian identity spread and consolidated at first in the 19th century 
before the foundation of the Italian nation state. And in that moment, I believe that race was not very important. And uh, there is, for example, an anecdote from the biography of Giuseppe Garibaldi that I think shows this point that I'm trying to make. In the early years, before uh, he turned famous, he used to travel a lot uh, as a seaman. And he went to the Ottoman Empire, to Latin America, to the US. And in every, pla in every place where he was going to, he always met these uh, Italian communities that named themselves as Italian workers communities, even though Italy did not yet exist. And in these communities, there was not one race according to themselves, because there were people from uh, Piedmont, from, uh, from the South, and, and those people like, had different languages, but even different skin colors. And they perceived themselves as from different races, but yet they chose uh, to create communities of mutual help according to nationality and not according to race. And the nationality they all felt part of was Italian nationality. And this was like one century before the, the founding of the Italian uh, nation state. And yeah, so I'm just wondering, what do you think about that? How, how, how much you think race was important at the beginning of the, of the imagination of Italian identity? Um, hi, uh, thank you very much for, for the workshop and for all the uh, contributions. I, I had a question for Federico, but since he left, I will try to transform it into a, a general re reflection that maybe um, some of you want to uh, pick up on. Um, so I was particularly interested by um, aspects of racialization in the context of bordering and migration policy. And uh, in particular, uh, listening to, to what Federico was saying and uh, to, to general knowledge of the field, I, I was uh, thinking of uh, a further level of, uh, of complexity that I think is very important and it also relates very much to urban situations and urban struggles, which is the racialization in the context of uh, crime migration policy and border policing, which is, uh, of course, uh, increasing very much uh, in Europe as in other uh, any part of the world, um, and in particular, I was thinking of uh, uh, instances of racializations in the context of the um, anti-migrant smuggling framework that we see in particular in the Mediterranean Sea, but also at other borders of Europe, where I see a twofold racialization, which is, uh, uh, I think, very challenging, not only, of course, analytically, theoretically, but uh, above all, uh, in practice for uh, people uh, on the ground and in solidarity with the uh, racialized, uh, uh, with people, um, victims of uh, rationalizations. So on the one side, I, I think it's, uh, uh, we see growing instances in the, in the anti-smuggling uh, activity of states and of, uh, of the European Union. We see a rationalization, of course, of smuggled people. I, I see, uh, I mean, we see in the, in the, the reports, in the evidence, we, we gather a lot of victimization, a lot of this idea of the white savior who goes there and saves people that are incapable of taking care of themselves, incapable of making their own choices. And this is something we see in narratives, but we see this even more in, in policies. I mean, this is how policies are shaped, and uh, it, it's again this, uh, instead of uh, uh, like building frameworks that are built together with uh, with uh, the idea of uh, dealing with people. <laughs> the idea is that we're not dealing with people, but with victims that need to be saved by the white man, of course, because it, it needs also to be a man, not only a white person. But uh, even more interesting, perhaps, I, that there are also growing interest in instances of racialization of smugglers as well, which is something which we do not tend to think very much about, but it's something we, which happens indeed. So uh, there is uh, increasing, not only profiling of people, so we think, okay, these people has these specific characteristics, so he, again, a male, needs to be a smuggler, but it's also the very manufacturing of smugglers. So we, and, and I see also in these an example of racialization. So it's the very policy, like, um, the exclusionary policies that we have, these uh, racializing policies that turn people into smugglers. So that's, that's what is happening. And that's, uh, again, what, uh, um, what is uh, maybe uh, visible um, uh, as, uh, in, in a very, in a very um, explosive way in the Mediterranean Sea again. So uh, again, 
people turned into, into smugglers and uh, profiled uh, after a profiling um, uh, system. So uh, I see what, what I see particularly interesting in all these is not only the phenomenon per se, which is of course very uh, terrible as it is, but it, it's also the struggle which is which is mm, growing, which is growing around these uh, these instances. Because uh, I think that uh, it's a very interesting example of an anti-racist struggle which goes beyond dichotomies and which, uh, in a way, merges. The, the, the fight for smuggled people, the fight with smuggled people, and the fight for, for smugglers and with for smugglers. There are growing examples in Sicily, in Greece, and I think it, it would be very interesting to look at, at all this, uh, these instances because they uh, not only uh, give us the opportunity to go beyond this apparent dichotomy, but also to, to solve in a way the, the, the conundrum that is in that and to, to understand the, the increasing racialization of these, uh, of these policies. I know three questions are already uh, some, but uh, there is also a question from home and I would just like uh, say all the questions now and then have, I would say maybe 10 more minutes, I don't know, what Sarah, uh, to answer. Uh, Silvia Ganceva, who's following us uh, on YouTube, asked, are there any policies or activism to push for a more comprehensive data collection about race and ethnicity in Italy and at the EU level also? In Bulgaria, it is pretty much the same lack of data. And on this, I wanted to connect. I also have uh, a very small... Uh, uh, question which connects to what you were saying about the fact that there's not really a willingness to recognize the race as a form of, of oppression in an explicit like using the word race and this has an impact on uh, the non-existence of databases as uh, also Silvia was uh, was uh, pointing out and this uh, was uh, like make, making me think about uh, Dublin regulation and how in fact, um, one of the biggest uh, databases that we have at the European level is the fingerprinting one, which is a biopolitical dispositive of controlling also like uh, people moving around Europe. And that's like uh, based on a, um, like a very recent technology. Um, and, and then like uh, my, my point is, uh, is not that you don't have data, database on race uh, as a system of oppression, and that's true, but like you end up having uh, actually a racist database because in fact these are like uh, collecting just data on uh, migra migrants arriving in the first in the first. <coughs> okay, it's it's quite difficult for me because I sense that you want this discussion very much about Italy and data and race. But coming from the outside, I'd like to say things that might sound a bit hard. Collect your own data. Don't wait for the state to change. Go out there and collect your own data and bring it together. And you see, you know, this isn't going to be done politely going to be done through shock and shame and activism. Um, and I think this is, you know, it, it's not, I don't believe in a league table of countries and one country is better than the other. That's just, it doesn't work like that. We judge ourselves by our own standards. Are we going forward or are we going backwards? But, you know, certainly in the UK, we collected our own data about racism in the police. We, and you start with cases, you start with the local, you start with the cases, you bring all the cases together, you bring out pamphlets, you turn a case into a cause, a cause into a national issue, uh, you know, and that's the way that you're going to do things. And actually, with your comment, I thought was really shocking in the sense of what it described, and it reminded me of what Angelica was saying about this... Uh, intellectual tradition here in Italy, which is the university is an ivory tower. It's a perfect space. It's a universal space. But we all know what universal spaces are. Um, so, you know, 
why does Angelica have to go to Canada? Why on earth is she gone to Canada? Why wasn't everyone rallying around her and saying, she's doing important research at the university, we don't want to lose her? Why don't you... <laughs> You're not. Is it... But, you know, you've got to... This is... Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, this is... <laughs> The point that I'm trying to make is until that you get to the fundamental, the fundamentals of the university isn't an ivory tower. The function of knowledge is to liberate. We're, we're, what, what you're doing at this session this afternoon is bringing the community here. This is absolutely right. That's what we've got, we've, we've got to do. So, I mean, I suppose that's, that's what I'm saying. Um, in terms of your comment, I may have misunderstood everything that you said, so forgive me, but I can only explain something from my own understanding that, yes, everything you're saying about smuggling, and the, nar the narrative is, is true, the narrative around the white saviour, all this, but actually the narrative isn't always the reality on the ground. And I mean, certainly in our work at the Institute, we pull out two pamphlets, which were bringing our data together about people who were being prosecuted for crimes of solidarity. Um, uh, search and rescue crew members, captains of ships, whether they were white men or white women, being prosecuted by the state under aiding illegal immigration laws for saving people's lives. So I kind of quite don't quite see the narrative is the same thing in, as in terms of uh, the state, for me, the state is abandoning people in the Mediterranean Sea. That's life unworthy of life. The state should be putting the resources to save people's lives. So if people are going to save their lives or they're going to intervene at land borders, it doesn't really matter to me whether they're, whether they're, what, what colour they are. But at the same time, I would say what's ignored in that debate is the fact that those who suffer the most prosecution for going to aid, people's, uh, aid people and save their lives are actually um, uh, black humanitarians. Uh, I mean, there was big prosecutions of a guy in Denmark, uh, I can't quite remember his name, he was in Lesbos. I think he was originally from Iraq or I Iraq, and he was uh, arrested at being part of these search and rescue missions. Who knows about him? So I, I do see that kind of differently, and I think sometimes that we mustn't always go just for the narrative. We have to look at the facts on the ground. <clears throat> allora, any things to say to these questions? Uh, Marco, sì. um, it's, it's, it's super complicated because monitoring also using this category uh, in a way perpetuate the use of race, right? Mm, so having this kind of classification. I remember I lived in the UK for 10 years and I remember at the beginning it was very shocking for me saying what I was on every form I was doing because I was not used to it. Um, so for many of us, this kind of classification are a bit uh, horrifying because we have this ghost of, you know, um, uh, ideas of race as used in 1938 or 1943. Mm, obviously, we are talking about a different conception of race. So this is, I think, is the missing link. This, Today, when we talk about race, people instantly think about biology. While we are not talking about that, we know that our mm, genetic diversity is basically non-existent. So we are the same. There is not a gene that makes us belong into a certain race. We have different biological histories, but there is a concept that has been invented, and this concept has implications still today on people. So it seems fair that we, rather than having uh, equality, we want equity. This is a big difference. So we want to give people the same tools to achieve 
their life goals. Uh, and to do that, we need to see where the injustices are. Education, so who has access to university? I think it's really important to know how is the body, uh, body composed. Uh, m maybe the question, what is your color? Maybe it's more, how do you self-identify? Yeah, okay. what color do you identify? Yeah, maybe, I, I don't know if I would put color, but usually when you see this kind of forms... The question was, what is your... Uh, mm. question, the, the yeah, yeah, yeah. That has been uh, rejected complete, completely, of course, because it's seen as racist. What Angela was saying is as a racist practice rather than monitoring racism. Um, so we, we are stuck here. We are stuck in this question where we don't know like who experienced what and why. So for example in schools we know that racist bullying is one of the most prominent, but we cannot we don't know who is experiencing this and specifically because they have a certain color. So uh, but in terms of monitoring, we are monitoring there are many uh, groups uh, database uh, and I just would like to mention here uh, Cronache Ordinario Razzismo and Lunaria. Uh, when we have to do research on uh, hate crime and racist crimes, uh, I often go there and you can do your own database because you see who has been attacked, when, why, where. So there is this huge database that is uh, Cronache of Ordinario Razzismo. They publish Libro Bianco del Razzismo. Now they're on their fifth edition. So. We are doing it, even if the state is uh, uh, not. Uh, but I, I don't want to uh, dismiss the problematic sides of monitoring in using kind of data, because we perpetuate ideas of race. That's uh, inevitable, but we, we see it with a different, uh, in a different way. So we can use it to our own advantage rather than to discriminate and create database, because I remember at some point, I don't know if you remember, there was this idea by um, Lega to, have, to um, um, have a database of Roma people. That's obviously, that's a racist database. So it's very interesting, this blurred line between racist database and the database that help us to prevent racism. It's a very subtle line there, at least in Italy. Uh, then there was the question on uh, uh, national imagination, right, and Italians. Um, so what, what they argue is that um, whiteness, implicit idea of whiteness, have been uh, fundamental to create Italians today. Mm? And otherwise we wouldn't, if, if you are Italian and you are non-white, you wouldn't get these questions. So when I... If I'm in Britain, for example, or in Canada, um, asking where are you really from uh, would be a very offensive question that not many people would have the audacity to ask. While in Italy is actually very common. Mm? And if you argue, people say, oh, it's just curiosity, you know, you look, blah, 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 blah. So there is this very different idea of um, what does it mean to be Italian. Um, and I think maybe the proximity to Africa is, is, a, is also a key point, uh, because you know, uh, when one of the founding fathers, Luigi Farini, goes to Calabria, he writes a letter to Cavour, and he says, uh, he's shocked. He thinks this is Africa, this is not Italy. He writes this, he said, these peasants, um, compared to even the Bedouins, compared to these peasants, are more civilized. So I think this, first internal colonization of the South, where the South is seen as black. Then we have Mussolini that manages, through the use of the Mediterranean category, to whiten the whole of Italy. And so we are Italians because we are not like the people we have uh, colonized Africans. So I think how colonialism is really essential also in that sense. We discover well, white Italians discovered their Italianness through the opposition to African otherness. Um, 
And how, because they were not seen as white as other Europeans, well, they invent their own categories of whiteness. So the Mediterranean becomes a very contested discursive category on, in which to put a lot of, um, of these ideas. So we are Mediterranean, uh, but we are still white. And this goes to your idea. Um, actually, we wrote this book, The Black Mediterranean, specifically to do a bit what you were saying, right? To see racialization, all the processes of racialization within this space that is not just geographical, but is also symbolic. So the Mediterranean uh, is seen as a, as a place of death, in, and inevitably is, but also a place of rebirth, but also a reservoir of stories. And so this is, Federico is not here, but these um, anti-racist practices created by migrants crossing the Mediterranean, form of activism, this is super important. Um, and so we, we saw a bit the black Mediterranean, a way also to um, face this idea of white innocence that is so prominent. Uh, that you were mentioning is so embedded in within white saviorism. Uh, so we like we need to save them because we have oh, the capabilities, the the, uh, the civilization. Um, and yes. Any other questions? Okay. Here, the morning session. Uh, thanks a lot to our guest speakers. <laughs> it was really uh, thought provoking and patience and the answers you give. Uh, we continue the debate in the afternoon with the round table with activists. So we resume at uh, 3 30 until 5. Uh, we will have the round table with the representatives of uh, three movements that are active now on, the, on, the, on these issues in Italy. That are Movimento Migranti Rifugiati Napoli, Rete di Donne Migranti Figli Roma, Italiani Senza Cittadinanza and Black Lives Matter Bergamo. Uh, I would like to remind you that in the afternoon the panel will be in Italian. Uh, if you need translation, you can just uh, ask me or Anna. Uh, so translation from Italian to English. So now we will have a break and have lunch with the speakers of the morning and afternoon session. Thanks everybody for attending and see you later. <laughs>